Uh, and with me today, I've got Claire Shand from Westgate Labs. Uh, so she is an equine rammer and the marketing director in the family business, which is Westgate Labs. Um, and also got myself, I am with Blue Chip Feed. So I am the customer communications officer and also run some of the nutrition bits. Um, so today, yeah, we're going to talk to you about managing parasite control. And then we also have some questions that we'll answer later in the webinar. So I'll just hand you over to Claire now and then she can do her slides on parasite control. That's brilliant. And um, thanks so much for inviting us to chat to you and for your enthusiasm and amazing questions that you've sent through already. Um, from those, we know that there are so many questions about this. So in our time that we've got today, we're going to try and cover off as many of those as possible and really like let's get us on the front foot of our parasite control for our horses to keep them healthy. So this is what we're going to cover. We're going to look at what wormer resistance actually is, this buzzword that I'm sure you've heard already when we talk about worming and wormers. We're going to look at the latest status, so where are we at? What does this actually mean for us as horse owners? And then the real important bit, how do we tackle it? You know, what are we going to do to keep our horses healthy? That's both now and into the future. So the first thing really that I want to look at is this parasite life cycle, which is um, broadly speaking, how all the parasites that are in our horses get there infect our horses and then what does the challenge look like because the thing is is that these parasites are so um evolved to infect our horses these little tiny microscopic eggs are all around us in the environment and this is the challenge that we have as horse owners the adult worms themselves they live in the belly of the horse generally they can li lay tens of thousands of eggs every day and it's these eggs here that are passed out in the dropping of the horse that we can then monitor when we do the worm egg counts in the lab and this is what's then infecting the pasture that our horses are grazing on so the eggs get laid in the dung they then hatch within a few days and if you're a tiny larval worm then your aim in life is to crawl as far away from a dropping as possible, get up a blade of grass and get back inside a horse to carry on your life cycle. And it's this little image here that never fails to fascinate me when I see it. So these are these tiny larvae of worms in a dewdrop on a blade of grass. And this is how many of them are hanging out there just waiting for a horse to come back along, graze that, they get the larva back inside the horse and they can carry on their life cycle to infect our horses again. Now, the way we keep horses now really plays into this evolutionary development of these worms because the horses are kept in single species fields, they graze back over and over the same patch of land, and that's why we're getting so much infection and it's such a problem um, within our horses. And we've had some questions about, well, what does that look like? Um, parasites uh, can cause weight loss, they can cause colics, in youngsters scouring and things like that, um, coughing because of the migratory phases that some of particularly ascarid and lungworm have, um, all kinds of ailments within the horse and ultimately death, which is really what we're trying so hard to prevent um, but sadly horses can and do in this day and age actually die of parasite burdens. Now wormer resistance is one of the biggest challenges that we currently have facing us in the veterinary industry so the worms are really clever and they're evolving to evade the chemicals that we have at our disposal so as we get more resistance, we are unfortunately going to see more of this disease that is untreatable in our horses. So this is what we're really trying to prevent. So, but what is it and how does it actually happen? Well, wormer resistance is the ability, the heritable ability, that's an inherited, so it's genetic ability of the worm to survive treatment with an anthelmintic, which to you and me is a wormer. So the worm is said to be resistant if it survives exposure to the standard recommended dose of that wormer. So you give it, the horse needs worming, you give the wormer and none of the worms actually die off. So that's when we get into this problem. And it's something that evolves slowly over time. So 
generally when a worm is released onto the market, it has to be around 95% effective um, in order to get that license. When we give the wormer, a few of those um, can survive that, that means. And eggs from these resistant worms get shed onto the pasture to continue their life cycle. So very slowly over time, this population of worms that you can't treat with the wormers actually grows and grows over time. So to be exposed um, to a wormer, that's when the worms can actually develop this resistance. So if we're not giving the wormer, there's nothing for the worms to develop against, if you see what I mean. So, um, but gradually we get to this point where all the worms on the horse pasture are, or more or less are resistant. And that's when we get into a pickle with horses at high risk of disease and not being able to get on top of those burdens. And when we look at this table, which looks really quite confusing from the outset, but if you look down the left hand side here, we've got these are the chemicals that we've got licensed in this country to treat these parasites. And for all the brand names that you'll know and see on the shelves, um, there are actually only five chemicals there. A little bit like um, going into the chemists and there's lots of different brands that we can get for ibuprofen, um, but actually it's the, the same drug underneath that. And then across the top there, we've got all the parasites that we're looking to treat um, in our horses. Let's uh, see if I can make this um, next bit work. Ah. Here we go. Oh, no. We're kind of in the middle of this. This is kind of weird, isn't it? Um, which is the one that I want? Let's go back. Start again. OK, here we go. Right. So the adult small red worm um, that are highlighted here at the, in the first of our columns, these are the ones that are the most numerous parasite of um, most horses that we get ubiquitous around the world and a really massive challenge. So 95% of any horse worm burden is likely to be these guys. They have an adult stage, um, which is four different chemicals there to treat, um, and also an insisted stage, which is the larval, very dangerous stage of their life cycle. And what's really worrying is we can see here, actually there now isn't a chemical that isn't showing some level of resistance and um, what for treating these which um i mean that's a great big red flag the older style chemicals here the fenbendazoles that you'll know as panicure pyrantels you know the likes of stronged p ember tape they've been around the longest and there is the most resistance to them thoughts of up to 80 percent resistance in this um pink band here to the fenbendazole and often 50, 60% pyrantel um, in some places. So that's where there's been used a lot on the same land over and over as we saw from that previous slide. But now even our more modern chemicals here like ivermectin and moxidectin are also starting to show this resistance um, in research that's been done, which you know is, is pretty frightening really. And then we look al along here, the roundworm ascarid. Um, conversely, we'll see, interestingly, on the treatment, that actually the older style chemicals for this one, the panicures and py pyrantels, like your stronged P, are much more effective against this parasite. But when we get into our more modern chemicals, they've already, the worms have already got some re um, pretty significant resistance to these chemicals. So, we talk a lot about the wormer that does everything. Um, I think you'll all kind of appreciate which one I mean by this one. Um, you know, it's the likes of our um, Aquest, Aquest Pramox, those chemicals um, there. And um, we can see now that actually this isn't the case. You couldn't give that um, to a youngster and know that it treated all those, um, both those particular parasites that are of concern. So, what this really means is that nearly every equestrian property that we've used wormers on and you know over the years is going to have resistant parasites. We can't just give a wormer anymore and know that it's worked, be confident that that's been effective. By exposing the worms over and over, this is only going to grow. And one of the problems is we're not really sure just now where these problems are occurring because we're not looking for it. We're not testing for it. So we don't even know most of most of us, I would say, where we have chemical resistance on our pastures and where we don't. The good news, if there is such a thing, is that the um, 
testing is really on our side. So unlike the chemicals where we're really running out of options and things are looking a little bit tight, the science of testing is on our side. So our faecal worm accounts here, which are the cornerstone of our programmes that we're going to go on and talk about, can identify 15 to 20 percent of horses that need worming. That's reducing by up to 82 percent, which is pretty phenomenal. On our right here, we've got the Equisile tapeworm test that for, was formulated and released in around 2015. Fewer than 30 percent of the horses that we test with that actually require a treatment for tapeworm. So that's lots of horses then that are saved getting a treatment again and um, that they otherwise would have had. It's that exposure thing. If we can minimise that exposure, that's really um, what we're on to. And we've also now got this blood test um, which detects the insisted stages of that small red worm, that dangerous one that I alluded to a couple of slides ago. So it's a fantastic development and it's all only going to get better in terms of our um, ways of dealing with um, and testing for these parasites that we've got. Just a word on the chemical side of things. I mean, the trouble with the wormers themselves is that they're very, very expensive to license. And that's why we're really seeing um, no new ones coming onto the market. Agriculture, they're a little bit better than that because of food producing animals. There's much more investment in that side of things. Uh, we've seen some of the wormers, like the mo more recent ones that we've benefited from, the moxidectins and um, the like, come over from agriculture. Now, the most recent ones that we've had um, developed in sheep that have come out recently aren't actually good for horses, um, and so we haven't been able to benefit from that one, unfortunately. Um, and there aren't any more in that development. So instead of just reaching for the chemical, we're really starting to need to try to understand where are those parasites? Um, so blanket treatments um, are really old hat. It's absolutely not where we want to be with our worming programmes anymore. Because we know from testing that we've got 80% of the worms are in 20% of the horses. So that means of a herd that are all kept and managed the same, that when we actually test them to see the worm egg counts, where are the high egg shedders within that herd? we're going to find some really variable results. So we're going to see that um, for a lot of the horses, they can really manage parasite resistance very easily or very well themselves and keep that to a manageable level within them that's not going to cause any pathological damage that we might have seen um, you know, in the, in the looked at in our earlier slides. Some horses, though, for reasons of, I mean, so varied reasons, genetic, um, definitely is a trait that's passed um, down. So we see um, some breeds of horses anecdotally wormier than others, like Highlands and um, Frisians and Arabs, for example, um, for some reason. But also that can be um, to do with individual immune systems. So the young and old are often a lot wormier because they've got either undeveloped or challenged immune systems. Um, but also if a horse has got something like an active ongoing kind of um, complaint. Again, we'll see the challenge there. So um, EMS horses, um, PPID or, you know, you might know that as Cushing's, um, laminitis, anything like that that can challenge the whole horse's immune system. And I think Pierre's going to talk about this later on, um, is also then going to be more easily challenged by parasites. And it also can be due, due to things like behaviour to so horses that graze closer to piles of dung. Um, likely to pick up those larvae that are crawling away from those piles that we saw um, on our pasture um, and therefore more likely to expose themselves to that challenge. So what we're going to do is test the whole herd, identify, you know, where are those high egg shedders within that herd and then get the right treatment for the horse and the parasite at the time of year. So really referring back to that, um, the chemical list that we had to very much target the right treatment there um, that we've got for the horses. And these are the tests that we're going to use most regularly really well. Number one, cornerstone of any targeted program is a faecal worm egg count. So we're going to do this every eight to 12 weeks through the grazing season. And that's really targeting these small red worm um, predominantly because their life cycle is so fast. 
that's why the schedule is so frequent for these particular tests. I mean, we tested a foal, for example, at four weeks old, um, and that was already showing a positive worm egg count for redworm. So that's how quick um, these parasites can actually get inside our horses and begin to infect them. I mean, it's just amazing. But we can also use them for reduction testing, which I'm going to go on and have a little um, chat with you um, in a bit, but it's about actually using this test as a follow up to ensure that that treatment has been effective, really monitoring that and very much starting to get some percentages of how effective the chemical treatments have been so that we can measure that. And number two there is our tapeworm testing. So this we can do either as a blood serology or now as the Equisal saliva test. Um, so going to the other end of the horse and this is measuring the antibodies that the horse is producing against the tapeworm infection or any that might be present. And we can monitor that and then know whether the treatment is needed because the worm egg counts. Although we do see the tapeworm eggs in there from time to time, it's not definitive because the eggs of the tapeworm are released in packets rather than being very evenly spread through the dung, like for our redworm and our ascarids there. And then this third one here is this ELISA for the small redworm again, which detects these insisted stages that can be so dangerous. And that's because I think you can see on this image here, the tiny little larvae, they generally will go through a development stage where once they get into the horse, they're not quite ready to become sexually mature within the horse. So they will actually bury themselves into the gut wall and spend around sort of 10 to 14 days there growing up, just kind of chilling out a little bit um, before they are ready to emerge and to go on to their adult stage of their life cycle. But they're also not stupid. So as the temperatures drop on the pasture and the um, activity actually slows down, it's better for them to be tucked away inside the horse in what we call an inhibited stage. And so they will go into these little tiny cysts within the gut wall and they can stay there for up to three years till the conditions are right. So they um, and but this particularly happens over the winter when the weather gets colder. And what they're looking for is an opportunity in the spring, usually, um, to come out and um, really sort of kickstart the life cycle of the small redworm for the horse and that infection level. So what that does is it triggers a mass emergence sometimes of all these tiny insisted larvae that are there within the gut wall. And this can be really dangerous for the horse because all these tiny cysts and, and the research is saying that there can be, you know, up to a million or so of these in a heavy infection of the, in, within the horse. All of these coming out at once can trigger this really difficult colic um, that's very hard to treat because so you've got this bloody diarrhea that's coming out within the horse. You've got this active colic um, and all this gut damage and shock to the system. Um, and that's what can be very, very dangerous. And, we, you know, we do lose horses every year um, in the UK um, because of this insisted small redworm burden that horses get. So anyway, there's a blood test now which can also help to detect that and to know um, a bit more about the, the levels of infection um, for that particular stage of that worm. We've also got incidental tests here for pinworm. We're going to go on. We've got some questions about pinworm that people have submitted. Um, we've got a Bayham and sedimentation test, which specifically looks for lungworm. Um, so that's with donkeys particularly um, and mules in the, that are very prone to that particular parasite. And also there's an ELISA blood test um, for liver fluke. We can at certain times of year do a worm egg count for that. Liver flukes aren't like they aren't kind of pure parasites of horses, but actually if you're grazing, cross grazing with sheep and cattle on waterlogged wet ground and you've got this intermediate host of a mud snail present, all these things have to align, then there's a possibility of getting a liver fluke infection there within the horse as well. So it's just something to be aware of. And so what we're building this up into is an overall strategy um, for how we approach horses worm burden. So rather than being ad hoc, I'd really encourage you to look at a year programme and what we need to get into um, this for the horse. So breaking it down into seasonality. So 
the worm egg count is the one that we're going to do the most um, often because of these quick life cycles. So for a healthy adult horse, we're thinking of doing something every season. So we start spring, summer and autumn. That's roughly every 12 weeks, getting that worm egg count in for our red worm and our ascarid. If you had any youngsters or horses that were high risk, you might want to narrow the gap between that to every eight weeks just to make sure that you're not letting anything get out of hand um, within the horse. But generally, this is sufficient for most healthy adults. Then into the late autumn winter, if you had the low worm egg counts of under 200 eggs per gram through the grazing season, then your horse would definitely be a candidate for doing that insisted red worm blood test and potentially saving you a proactive treatment. If you've had counts of over that through the year, then you're going to want to actually treat proactively because it's a high likelihood that there's going to be some of those insisted larvae in that gut wall that we're going to want to treat and get rid of um, for the horse. And for that, moxidectin really is your absolute best bet if you can um, for treating that because of it being the most effective. Um, we've also then going to do every six months something the tapeworm. So either spring and autumn or summer and winter, depending on your programme, we're going to be looking to do that saliva swab in the horse's mouth, testing for antibodies um, and checking on the tapeworm levels there and whether we need to treat. The other thing we need to look at is these reduction tests. So where we do need to treat, if any tests say that we do, then we want to be following that up with another test. Um, for a worm egg count, that's 10 to 14 days after. For an Equisil test, that's two months after. And um, just to make sure that the chemical's been effective and to know, like, you know, what's going on on the pasture. Are the worms susceptible to those chemicals that you're using? Or are we going to need to step in and use a different drug for that? So really, really helpful to be starting to look at that. So we're just going to take a little bit of a look um, at uh, doing the worm egg count samples. So getting a good test um, is really dependent on, as much as anything on the sample that we've got. Um, the first real thing is timeliness. You know, we've um, got about six days for a viable result on a worm egg count. So freshness really counts. Um, the red worm and the ascarid that we're targeting with a worm egg count are spread pretty evenly through the dung. But if you can take three to four pinches from across the dropping, that's going to really help get a good representative sample. And then filling the pot to the top to exclude the air gap. So horses do enough. Please don't be stingy um, is our message. And then if you can pack that pot full, we don't need a great deal to take through the testing process, um, but excluding the air gaps really going to help and then get that um, sealed and labelled and off to the lab um, for the test. And we'll put that through a process where we take a measured amount of the dung. We take it through what we call um, a modified McMaster technique to float off any eggs that are present from the sample. And this is what we're looking at when we look under the microscope. So you can see there we've got a very round there ascarid egg. We've got these three red worm eggs down the bottom. Don't know if you can see those there. And then also unusually a tapeworm egg. So this is like a D-shaped um, little parasite egg there of the tapeworm. This was all in one three year old racehorse, so it actually wasn't out grazing, um, but it is younger. So by very nature, that means that we're likely to see more parasite eggs um, than we would in a healthy adult horse. But it is quite unusual to see all these three in one. And also we've got the tapeworm there, which we do see tapeworm eggs and often we will report them when well, we will always report them when we see them. But if we don't see tapeworm, we can't definitively say the horse hasn't got that. So which is why we advise for the Equisile test. Um, and um, this is what the lab that results are going to look like. So it's going to be an eggs per gram reading that we're going to have. We use the scale of the um, Morden um, Research Institute, which um, it says that up to 200 eggs per gram and um, the horse has got a low burden and actually doesn't need treatment at this level. And there is a lot of thinking that actually some parasite burden is really healthy for the horse to stimulate immune system. It's med it's come from human medicine. So apparently we're seeing a lot more autoimmune diseases within humans because we've got this um, much more kind of 
um, astringent approach to cleanliness, so taking out our, our microbes and bacteria and things like that. Very similar for the horse that actually a small amount is fine to have within the horse. It's just when it we want to step in when it gets to a particular level so that we never see these pathological symptoms within the horse you know, the, and the disease um, that they could potentially bring. So between 200 and 1200 is a medium count um, and at that level we're going to want to step in with a chemical to treat that. Over 1200 we say as a high count the horse needs worming and we're also going to want to have a little chat about well what else can we do in order to stop that becoming a problem in the future management wise and other things um, in order to mean that the horse stays healthy. People do panic when they see these counts in the thousands and but they you know we do happen fairly frequently um, and just to reassure people and um, the highest worm egg count we've ever had in the lab was 84,000 so um, that was a very ill horse but um, you know that's kind of the, the upper level of what we'd see and certainly not something that would be there um, it, you know it's, it's not a frequent kind of level of infection but um, that was a particular highlight, um, not for the horse, unfortunately. And then reduction testing. So we've talked a little bit about this, but it's about identifying does the horse need treatment? What would be the most effective treatment do we think for that? But following up to make sure that that actually has been effective. So 10 to 14 days later, putting a second worm egg count into the lab. So important because we just can't give a wormer now and expect that it's going to do that job, unfortunately. And there's just some little images here of that in our lab, a worm egg count test going through um, the process there. The Equisile sample um, is pretty revolutionary in that it's a saliva test and it's an ELISA, so it's measuring antibodies that the horse is giving um, to any tapeworm infection that's present. In order to stabilise that saliva and get the most um, accurate test, the horse hasn't got to have eaten drunk or been exercised for 30 minutes before. So take, bring them in, brush, tie them up, brush them, just make sure that they aren't um, able to reach anything there or do anything that's, that might cause salivation. But actually it's a pretty easy test to do. It goes into the dental space where the bit usually goes and most horses are pretty tolerant of it as well more so than you might think and what we get from this is a, a saliva score reading it's actually a minus um neg like a negative um scale so it can be a little bit um difficult to interpret but we don't really need to focus on the numbers more so this low borderline or moderate high just that shows whether the horse needs treatment or not so we can see there the cutoff point that you're going to step in with a treatment for the tapeworm if it goes into that borderline reading there so it's um really really brilliant test um that's been developed so the regular testing that we're going to do and if we need to step in with chemical control it's really important that um, we do that in the right way so we have to choose the right wormer for the job and it's um so it's about particularly treating red worm for example and um, for most of the year an ivermectin is going to be a really good effective treatment to treat those adult stages of the red worm that we might be seeing but in the winter, a moxidectin will get the larval stages of that particular parasite. So we want to be avoiding exposing the worms to the moxidectin through the year and really like preserving that as a key medicine for treating the larval stages predominantly in that sort of autumn winter period. So it's really being aware of like what and when we're going to be using. Similarly, if we've got young horses, we're going to avoid um, using something like a, an ivermectin um, for a routine treatment and maybe step to something like a pyrantel because that's so effective against ascarids that really are parasites of young horses. Um, so really speak to your vet, your SQP, your Rama, so many confusing titles, 
um, and, and get their advice in terms of what we want to be stepping in with so that we make sure that we get, get an effective treatment, but we're also not overusing chemicals that we need to preserve for specific uh, um, treatments really in the horse. So right chemical, right time of year, give sufficient. Um, we really need to be aware of what our horses are weighing um, in order to give them the right dose and give um, enough if we are underdosing our horses, then that is going to aid resistance developing because it's not going to be sufficient to kill off the worms, but we've given another exposure to that wormer, so given them the opportunity to fight back against it. And using a weighbridge is the most effective way, but I'm appreciative that not everybody has access to that, but it's not really good enough just to be looking and assessing. And we've got this um, little um, image here of um, he's my Highland pony Bertie. He's about 14 hands on his tiptoes, um, but also about that wide. So, um, particularly if you let him, he would just eat his head head off. I think. Um, and we did a little bit of a um, Facebook um, fun quiz to get people to guess his weight by eye. And obviously, I appreciate it, you know it's from a photo. It's not as good as standing there real. Um, but it was really interesting to see the difference in the weight that people estimated. Um, so the height is 666, which, yeah, that's um, very much on the high side there um, for Bert. But the lowest was 310, which actually would have really underdosed him um, if we'd gone in at that level. The average was under, so had him at 472 kilograms there, when his actual weight is 525. Now, when we weight taped him, that came in slightly under at 518, which just underlines the advice that um, we give and that um, our vets would advise as well, is that so when you're giving a treatment, add 10 percent to a weight tape just to make sure that that's been effective. It will then um, there's tolerances that are very safe on the chemicals that we've got. So that will, will be the, the right sort of ballpark just to be sure if you haven't got a way bridge there. Administer that on a surface area a because actually there's not an awful lot of stuff within that those worming syringes that we've got so it means you can really monitor any spit out there and know whether the full treatment has been given it also means if any does get spilt that you can mop up easily because wormers are toxic um, particularly to dogs and collies but also to um, our flora and fauna um, dung beetles if they get into water courses very toxic um, to that as well so just something to be aware of get your reduction tests in and just ask you know there's so many places that you can go and get really good advice here at Westgate we're always happy to help if people have worm inquiries but also you know in your um, feed stores saddlers vets um, again they all want to help to get this right for people Management, here's me putting my money where my mouth is and doing my poo picking. Um, I cannot emphasize enough how important poo picking is and how much it will help you with your worm control. So poo pick as much as you can. What that's going to do if you can do it at least twice a week is it's going to take those eggs off the pasture before they have potential and you're going to really minimise that infection level that's there on your pasture. Put it in a muck heap that's at least three metres away from the field um, so that you're going to prevent any cross infection. That's how far those larvae can travel in the wet um, away from the piles of dung. So for a tiny larvae, that's pretty impressive. But um, yeah, let's not undo all your good work. Keep your muck heaps separate if you can. Keep your herd stable. So that means um, not introducing too many new horses, which could be bringing parasite challenges with them. Resting and rotating your grazing, because that means that then it gives a chance for any worm eggs that are on the pasture to degrade and lower that infection level. Three months is good, six months is better. If you can do a year, that's really going to help, particularly for those red worm, which are these ever present and so numerous. Uh, I mean, if you've got ascarids, so a lot of young horses on a field, um, the worm eggs from them can stay in the soil for up to 10 years because they've got this real sticky, hard outer shell. So particularly important to keep rotating your youngsters. Like if you're falling down in particular, you know, lots of people have one field they fall down in for, you know, it's easy access to 
the house, mine sheltered, but actually you could then easily get a buildup of ascarid, which are really big worms, horrible, um, to be within young horses and can cause a lot of damage. Cross grazing, so yeah, big tick in the box for any sheep, cattle, um, hens, anything that's going to come out across that land and um, be grazing over the um, the grass. The species, um, the parasites are usually species specific, so any larvae that are ending up inside a different species, they're toast, they're gone, and that's broken that life cycle, which is brilliant. So if you can mix and match a little bit, either put them together or put the sheep in or the cattle in after the horses have grazed, that's really going to help you. And making sure to quarantine and test new horses. Again, stop that um, potential for parasites coming in with horses that you're not sure on their worming history. You know, get them in, get them tested before you introduce them. And there's a big cross in the box there for harrowing. Um, unfortunately, although it makes our pastures look really nice and neat and scatters the dung, that's the problem is that all it's really doing is spreading the parasite problems around the pasture rather than containing them in the latrine areas when the horses will tend to um, graze the lawns and leave the latrines there, which separates out your infection problems that you've got. So in our climate, please don't do it. It's just it's not effective enough, unfortunately. So it's, it's thinking about not just our own horse, um, but the health of the um, field mates as well within that. We're thinking of all horses being needing good parasite control. That's from cobs right up to competition horses. And most importantly of all, getting it right not just for now, but for the future, because this is really where we're heading to is a crisis for the horses that are, you know, the next generations coming through. So if it's time to worm, um, I would really encourage you to think worm account first. Um, otherwise, where will we be when our wormers stop working? That's a real rattle through here of um, <laughs> Parasite control in horses, um, but I know that we've also got some um, questions coming up as well in the end after we've heard from your really um, important bits about immune and um, feeding for that support. Yeah, thank you so much. That was brilliant. So I'm just going to go through a little bit on the nutritional side of it. So obviously the only way you can deal with intestine, intestinal parasites is obviously with the prescribed medication that you get from your vet or your Rama or your SQP, whoever. Um, there's no feed that can sort this, but there are definitely things that we can take into account that can help. Um, so first of all, we want to ensure that your horse has got a healthy digestive system. Obviously, a healthy digestive system most of the time translates to a healthy horse and a healthy horse is better uh, able to cope with these parasitic burdens, like Claire has mentioned, um, if your horse has a compromised immune system, you might see them more predisposed to getting these worms um, and they can also, you know, get more consequences from having it as well. So the digestive health is really important for the overall health um, it sort of links together. So if you have digestive upsets, you're more um, uh, likely to have a compromised immune system. Um, and we also see some consequences after a horse has had intestinal parasites. Um, and there are th there is some research uh, sort of suggesting that there might be some uh, compromised utilization of the diet. So if you have um, certain intestinal parasites, for example, the insistent red worms that Claire was talking about, you can see that you have um, lasting damage to the lining of the stomach, which means that the horse isn't able to absorb the nutrients the way it should. Um, so that's obviously something you need to take into consideration. Um, like Claire's just talked about, the management routines, obviously it sort of does link to nutrition because if you have your horse out on grazing um, to let them you know, graze as part of their diet, um, there is definitely something we could think about as part of the management there. Um, we might need to change up our routines if you haven't um, sort of set them out to be ideal for limiting uh, parasitic burdens. So maybe you're not feeding enough 
So that leads to uh, weight loss and you can have compromised uh, immune system. Maybe you're feeding too much, uh, maybe you're not feeding often enough. Obviously with grazing, there's a reactive versus proactive approach. So like Claire talked about, the proactive approach would be to rotate your pastures um, and make sure that you poop it regularly, don't harrow it. Um, whereas a, a reactive approach would be to sort of address the problem once it's already occurred. Uh, most of the time it's already too late by that point. So grazing management is obviously more important than ever. If you can do your bit with grazing management, then you can sort of help reduce the risk of these parasitic burdens. Um, and just at the bottom here, I've got a question that is there a specific diet that might be more beneficial? Not necessarily. There aren't really any feedstuffs that, that can, you know, um, eliminate the risk of um, parasitic burdens. But there is some digestive support that you can offer that can obviously help if your horse does have worms. Um, so some supplements we can look at is obviously those that uh, help digestive health. So probiotics and prebiotics, nucleotides. Um, if your horse has had a parasitic burden, you might see a decrease in the um, diet uptake. So using probiotics and probiotics can be a great way to sort of restore the natural bacterial flora in the hindgut to make sure the horse can actually break down fibres, get their energy. Um, it's also really important to ensure the diet is balanced. An unbalanced diet can lead to quite severe health problems, which again can lead to um, compromised immune system, which means you can get more worms. It's always important to start with the basics. Uh, anytime you want to look at your horse's diet, forage is key. Whether that forage is conserved or fresh, whether it's grass or hay or haylage, um, always make sure your horse gets all the forage they need. And then you balance the diet with the vitamins and minerals they need. And then obviously you can add the calories at the end if your horse needs them for, for exercise. Um, it's also important to consider the overall health of the horse. Um, obviously, if your horse has had parasites, if it's had quite a heavy parasitic burden, you need to consider the prognosis for long term health. Um, is there anything you should do um, in con conjunction with your vet to address this? Um, are there any special nutritional considerations you need to take if the uh, if the damage is you know long lasting um, and your horse has got a decreased uptake of certain nutrients or certain parts of the digestive tract is there anything you need to change in the diet to address this um, and there's also obviously the supplements and additives and all this you can add into the diet to help if your horse does have a decreased uh, dietary uptake. For example, the nucleotides, which are part of the DNA and RNA, um, and they're really good for cell regeneration. And you can also get supplements for, for immune support as well. So like Claire's talked about, the morpho morphological factors, they play a key role. Younger horses, older horses, some certain breeds. Um, uh, obviously, if they've got any clinical issues, so EMS, PPID or Cushing's, laminitis. When the when the horse's body and immune system have to already fight this condition to be able to function normally, and then you add in those parasites as well, it often becomes like an overload. So it's quite important that especially those horses, you, you keep an extra eye on how they're doing. Make sure you um, do your worm egg count quite regularly so you can always be on top of it and watch out for any changes. Um, and then obviously I'm not going to talk about the resistance to wormers because compared to Claire, I've got absolutely nothing to add to that topic. She's already talked so much about it. But obviously we all need to do whatever we can to avoid this becoming the problem it looks like it's going to become. Um, once, you know, all the worms are resistant to the products we have and with no new products coming onto the market, there's nothing really we can do. And at that point, you know, we're going to lose horses to parasitic burdens just because there's nowhere to treat them. Um, yeah, so just talking about, I've, I've talked about digestive health and I've talked about the importance of a correct diet. So together, these sort of create the digestive supports. Um, and obviously, nutritional management is also a part of digestive health. You have to remember to feed little and often. 
and use hygienic management methods. So that is especially important with the poo picking and not the harrowing of the fields. Because like Claire said, if you harrow a field, in essence, you are just dragging all this dung around the field and spreading it everywhere instead of in concentrated piles. So it's quite, you know, counter counterproductive and you're really doing more harm than good. I just want to quickly touch on body condition scoring. Um, obviously, you need to know how much your horse weighs when you uh, calculate how much to give them with the wormer. Um, but body condition scoring is a great way of keeping an eye on how your horse is doing. Obviously, we see our horses every day. We're not going to notice any difference because we see them too often to see that change. So what we recommend is that anyone who's got a horse gets comfortable with body condition scoring. It's not going to replace um, a weigh brooch. It's not going to replace a weigh tape, but it's a really good way of spotting changes in weight before it's even visible to the naked eye. Um, it's also great to uh, use to sort of keep an eye on what's happening um, and that way you can sort of pinpoint any changes before you can see them and it also means you might be able to discover health issues that your horse has before they even become visible. Um, so there's two different different types you can use have been widely accepted by the scientific in, um, community. So you can either use the zero to five or you can use the one to nine scale. If you go online, you can find quite descriptive photos and how you use both of them. But the most important part is to be consistent with it. It's the same as your um, worm egg count. Set a schedule um, and make sure you follow that schedule. So with the body condition scoring, ideally get the same person to do it every time um, and do it at the same time of day as well. Right, so that concludes my part of our evening. So we did have some questions that were submitted. So prior to this webinar, we launched on social media um, and on the website asking people to send in their questions that they want answered by the expert. So I've put some questions on here and I'm going to let the expert answer them. So over to you, Claire. Uh, yeah, you're welcome. Thanks, Claire. Um, yeah, really interesting. Exactly what you were saying about scarring and um, take up of nutrients and that sort of thing. So important to get that right. And uh, yeah, interesting what you're saying about time of day of body condition scoring as well. But um, yeah, thanks for that. Learned something. Um, yeah, we had loads of questions. Thank you. And I tried to cover as many as possible in the presentation, but um, some really great ones here. Melanie, my horse has pinworm. What's the best way to clear it? Yeah, um, it's a pain really in the rear, isn't it, pinworm, um, and can be really difficult to get rid of as we are targeting our worm as more and being, a bit, um, you know, going on to test based programs. So giving fewer chemicals, we are seeing actually a rise in this. Um, the good news is that it's not dangerous generally for horses. You know, it's not a, a worm that's going to cause pathological damage within the gut. It's much more of an irritation. So if you see them, you'll see the horse rubbing and they can actually rub themselves raw because the eggs are laid in this sticky substance that really is very annoying and they'll rub on anything, you know, fence posts, stables, mangers, whatever. So there are two fold um, really ways to tackle this. We need to go in with a chemical. The older style chemicals are better for pinworm. So things like our pyrantel and our fenbendazoles um, seem to be much more effective at treating this. And the second thing we also need to do is the hygiene around it. So cleaning the horse's bum down um, daily, if you can, um, twice daily, just to remove those eggs that are present. Um, and also disinfecting anywhere they might rub as well. So cleaning down that because it's the eggs that then get shed onto these surfaces and then the horse can re-ingest them. And the life cycle is actually quite long. It's about five months. So you can think you've got it sorted and then they'll have ingested eggs and a few months down the line, you'll see these pesky little bean sprout things back again and you haven't quite got it. So it can they can be a nightmare, you know, quite frankly, um, some people, you know, if you're lucky, one treatment gets it. Other other people, you know, really struggle on. And and again, it's an immune system um, kind of predisposition, I guess, because you'll have a herd that are kept in the same place, and there'll just be one that has this persistent issue. Often, um, can be very hard to clear. But yeah, it's really it's being persistent with it, um, and making sure that you've you're on top of that 
um, the hygiene. You can test for pinworm. So we've got an adhesive tape test that we do, which is a clear sticky tape that you go across the horse's anus and it picks up those rugby ball shaped eggs. But if you're seeing the pinworm in the droppings, you know, there's absolutely nothing more positive than that as a, you know, identity of the identification of an infection. And uh, yeah, that's when you'd step in with the treatment and, and putting these things in place. Um, yeah, next question, lungworm. It's an interesting one. It is a parasite of donkeys um, and, and mules as well, because mules are more similar metabolically to donkeys um, than they are to horses. And it's really within those um, animals that the life cycle is much more able to continue. The donkey sanctuary said that fewer donkeys are actually infected with lungworm than first thought. So they think sort of around four or five percent. So it's quite minimal, but it is something that we do need to be aware of if we keep donkeys. And also if we have horses that live with them, they can also get infected. So we have what we call a BIM and sedimentation test. It's a faecal test um, and um, you can submit that to the lab, floats off the comparatively heavier lungworm eggs to identify them. So usually the horse is the one who will be coughing because that's one of the main symptoms of that. Um, but um, donkeys are so stoic. You'd want to test the donkey because it's probably the source of that infection. And that's where you're going to more likely identify them because of the way that the life cycle is able to, to do its thing in the donkey rather than the horse. But um, the horse that's going to be doing the good sort of, you know, melodramatic effect on that one. Uh, Sharon. That's a really interesting question um, about weight tapes. Absolutely, yeah, um, we said it before, worm to the weight of the horse and give a little bit extra if you're not sure, because that's absolutely going to make sure that we treat those worms and don't just expose them to another dose and give them that opportunity to build resistance. Uh, Caroline, does it help to keep on top of my worm burden and um, to use herbal wormers each month? Um, it's a really good question and the jury's sort of out on herbs and things. Obviously we've people have used herbs to support health conditions for you know, many centuries so you definitely can't do um, I was going to say you can't do harm, but you can always do harm with actives. But within products that are particularly marketed for this, um, the thinking is that it can only benefit. Um, what it's trying to do is to set up a situation within the gut that makes it less habitable to the parasites um, that we've got. So certainly you can support with that. And I think from the research that's being done, some of the future of our parasite control could be coming through the more natural approach. The real challenges are how do you license that? How do you put it in a palatable form where you're getting a specific dose of those um, and that's then easy to um, prescribe and then for um, to be taken by the horse and we're seeing things like tannins so um, for, within plants being one way of targeting parasites we know that sanfoin is a um, feed that's long been fed to animals to help with parasite burdens over the years there's just no licensing of that there's no actual scientific data yet um, but we might well get there the other thing is fungi, again, that's being looked at as a potential for a treatment, um, and it, but also same issues of licensing. And so it does cost an awful lot of money to make sure that these are safe and that we haven't got additional environmental issues and um, with using particularly things like fungi, which may come from different countries and potentially get out into pasture, that sort of thing, a pass through the horse. There's so much we just need to understand a bit more about. Um, what I will say is that if you're using Wormers to support the horse, really even more important to get your tests in and to make sure that that actually what you're doing is working. Because they, you know, some people do find benefit with them. And if you're testing, that's when you're really going to get a good appreciation of that. Um, Emma, yeah, similar question. Question, why aren't there any new chemicals being developed? It's really a cost thing. Um, you know, we've already seen in 2018, we lost um, Equitape from the market. That was our Prazoquantel only medicine for treating tapeworm in the horse. You can still get Prazoquantel over the counter with ivermectin and with moxidectin, but just not on its own. But if you only need to treat tapeworm, that really gives us a difficult situation um, because we don't want to be giving those other chemicals in combination because we don't want to be exposing particularly redworm, which they're going to target um, rather than 
it's just the tapeworm. You can go in with a double dose of pyrantel for that, but um, again, there is a redworm exposure there that's happening, albeit there's more resistance to redworm in pyrantel than there is um, within the ivermectin moxidectins that we're trying to preserve as our key medicines currently as our best route for it. So unfortunately, it's a cost thing. It's big pharma. It's balanced with you know, what does it cost to actually license these and get to market versus what the market, you know, what what's there in terms of profit margins. So I think that's our the particular challenge. You know, there's a, a lot of desire within the equine market, but we're reliant on um, these companies and um, being able to, to make their money back on this research. So. Uh, Sam, if my horse comes back with a negative poo sample and a negative saliva test, what do I do about the worms that aren't tested for? Should I worm yearly just to be sure? Well, it is a really good question. Um, definitely through the grazing season, negative fecal samples and saliva tests mean that we're not seeing parasites, you know, those uh, main parasites there that we need to treat for. It's just these insisted that aren't covered by those tests. So if you've had a series across the season of really good worm egg results, then we would really question, yeah, do you need to give that treatment? The proactive for the insisted stages of the redworm. The best advice probably would be to do that blood test. And that's going to give you then um, a real good insight with your vet um, on you need to give that um, treatment or not because if you can not give them oxidectin you know that's fantastic in terms of preserving that key medicine definitely so yeah um otherwise um for most horses that have had some sort of worm account you'd want to step in i think just to be sure with them oxidectin um, for most horses um in that winter time So um, everyone who submitted questions were entered in a giveaway. So congratulations to Elaine Powell. You won the giveaway. So you get a free choice of balancer from us and you get a goodie bag from uh, Westgate Labs. So Elaine, if you just get in touch with us on the email address on the slide, um, then we can get you a prizes. So Elaine also had a question which I thought was really good. So when should I test or worm for winter and which worm should I give? Yeah, so really predominantly it is this insisted stage of the red worm that we need to be addressing in this late autumn winter time. And uh, it's a little bit variable about when um, in terms of when did you give or when did you last test or when did you last treat? And then also, do you need to consider bots um, in your winter treatment, which some people do, depending on the area that you live in and whether you've seen those on the legs. It just, you know, it wraps that in um, with that insisted treatment because often it's the moxidectin that can do both for you. So it's gauging that. Um, often we want to wait until the uh, activity on the pasture has slowed down some. So when we get into the colder weather, below six degrees, the red worm is going to really, the activity is going to slow on the pasture. We're also going to start to see frost, which is going to kill off any bot eggs if we're targeting them. So it's a little bit like a, um, it depends, but those are the sort of environmental conditions you're looking for. And also basing that in terms of like, what what, do, what have you done last in, in terms of your parasite control as well? So yeah, there's a few things to consider there, but that's the thinking when we're giving our advice, you know, putting all those things in motion to support you on that one. Right, so that was it from us. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Claire, and thank you so much to everyone who's watching. We really do appreciate it. If you have any questions for either of us, you can find contact forms on both our website, which I've linked at the bottom of the slide. Um, and yeah. Thank you so much for joining us, Claire. It's been so good having you here and thank you for sharing all your knowledge. Perfect. Thank you so much for the opportunity. It's been great. You know, we love talking about parasites so uh, and spreading the message, really. Thank you.